Sometime in your life, you have to act as you think best. You can't compromise. You can't give in. Even if your critics are numerous and loud. Good afternoon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I just read comments from a letter the 41st President of the United States sent to his five children on the evening of December 31st, 1990, as he shared with them his thoughts on the decision he was about to make, a decision that manifested itself a few weeks later as the beginning of Desert Storm. Welcome to another Ancillary Foreign Policy Conference organized by the Skokoff Institute for International Affairs at the Bush School. I am Chuck Herman, the International Affairs Program Director, and it's my privilege to serve as the moderator for this extraordinary panel. On stage with me are four of the five individuals who are contributors to a forthcoming Oxford University Press book entitled into the Desert, Reflections on the Gulf War. Each author has remarkable experience and expertise to provide a vital perspective on the desert storm and how it has influenced events over the past 20 years. We are also fortunate to have with us Dr. Abdul Riyad Asiri, who is the Dean of the University of Kuwait's College of Social Science, who at the conclusion will give a brief response from an Arab perspective. In effect, you are about to get a sneak preview of a very important book. Incidentally, we are fortunate to have in the audience Dr. David McBride of uh, Oxford University Press, who will make this all come about. <coughs> By sharing their insight, with us today. The contributors to this book are providing us with an invaluable set of lenses through which we can understand and interpret the follow-on event this afternoon, which of course will transpire in Reed Arena shortly after the conclusion of this panel. By listening to these thoughtful analysts now, you undoubtedly will have a greater enhanced basis for understanding the American policymakers who you will hear later and who were, in effect, President George Bush's war cabinet. Because this event and the one in Reed Arena are back to back, we are under severe time pressures. And my task is to make certain that you have an equal chance to hear all our panelists before we adjourn. I've asked each one to speak not more than 15 minutes, which given their wealth of knowledge about the subject is a very serious constraint. Incidentally, at the conclusion of our program, all of you will have the opportunity to board free buses uh, here for the trip over to Reed Arena, thus avoiding the considerable hassle of having to find another place to park. I will provide more information about where and how to board these buses at the conclusion of this session. Each of our panelists has a remarkable career. You can read a brief biography on each one in your program. To save time, I will only make a short identifying introduction of each expert before they speak. But I urge you to read the fuller biographies in the program to get a more full grasp of the remarkable careers that provide the foundations for their remarks. Our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Richard Haas, who has held many key foreign policy positions in several presidential administrations, and now is president of the highly regarded and nonpartisan Council on Foreign Relations. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard Haas. Well, thank you, Chuck. Uh, my involvement in this issue is really from two perspectives. One, at the time, 
I was the senior staff member of the National Security Council who was responsible for this part of the world. And I was the uh, guy who then had a lot of hair who met President Bush at the helicopter in his famous this will not stand uh, comments uh, on the Sunday morning, mm -hmm. several days after the crisis began. But secondly, as Chuck said, I've been out of government uh, off and on since then. And I've tried to look at it also as an analyst and someone who tries to think uh, somewhat systematically about American foreign policy. So I'll try to give you a perspective, if you will, from both directions. And let me just make, I'm going to make three points. I don't know if we'll come out evenly to uh, one point for every five minutes, but we'll, uh, we'll move it in that, in that direction. Whoops. I'm going to make the points, though, if I don't drop my glasses. Uh, first point, it was right to wage this war. It was right to wage the Gulf War. It was a true war of necessity. What, we, what, what triggered it was a blatant act of aggression by Iraq under Saddam Hussein. And it was an act of aggression that violated perhaps the most fundamental principle of international relations, which is that states cannot use force against other states uh, in any other than for self-defense. So if, if there's one principle that is widely accepted in the world that is this, and it is actually the fundamental basis of international order as we, as we know it. In addition, the administration, if you recall, uh, after Saddam Hussein took Kuwait in early August, did not go to war right away, uh, rather took uh, approximately half a year, and tried other recourses. Uh, tried diplomacy, tried sanctions, what have you. So this was a reluctant war. This was not a war that was, uh, that was, or an act of aggression that was responded to in any way wantonly or, or, or quickly. So again, I believe it was, uh, in that sense, uh, totally legitimate in what was done. But also, to strengthen the argument, think for a minute about what would have happened had the administration not acted. What the historians call counterfactuals. Think what would have happened had Saddam Hussein been allowed to succeed. He would have controlled not simply his own oil, which he obviously began with, but also Kuwait's, together giving him about a fifth of the world's oil. But because of what he'd been allowed to get away with, I think he would have exercised effective control over Saudi Arabia's oil and everyone else in the region. He would have had, uh, if you're allowed to use French phrases again, what the French would call a droit de regard, a, a position of dominance uh, over his over his neighbors with, with, with all the rights, if you will, and benefits that would have come from it. He would have been the dominant power in the greater Middle East. We also now know that he was already quite far advanced in the development of nuclear weapons. So he would have been able to pour this added resources into the acceleration of his, of his nuclear program. Uh, the human rights situation in Kuwait, which was bad, would have become totally uh, awful. And at the time, again, this is 1990, 1991, these were the early months of the post-Cold War era. The Berlin Wall had just come down uh, on 11-9, as history played it out, 1989. The administration, beginning with the president, was cognizant every step of the way, every hour of the way, is that what was done and what was not done, how it was done, was going to set all sorts of precedents, all sorts of standards for what was this new period of history that was then dawning. And the, the feeling was if he had been allowed to get away with this wanton act of aggression, it might have been the first such act in the post-Cold Cold War era, it would not have been the last. But rather, others, him and others, would have taken note, and this would have become the new pattern of international relations, and obviously it would have been awful. So again, this was a war of necessity that was, in my view, entirely right for the United States to wage. Second point, it was waged right for the most part. It was done with an unprecedented international coalition. It was a uh, multilateralism, if you will, at its best, strong legal and diplomatic underpinnings, roughly a dozen or so UN uh, res resolutions. Uh, this was American leadership. It was not American unilateralism. And in the best form of leadership, there was tremendous international followership. Uh, there was partition, par par participation all around. Militarily, it was uh, a classic case, combined arms, uh, modern uh, Army, Marines, Air Force, Navy, all coordinating uh, extraordinarily well. You'll hear more about that from Michael Gordon. Uh, there was no mission creep. Unlike Korea, when the United States went north of the 38th parallel, war aims did not change in the middle of the war just because things were going well. 
It takes uh, great leadership at times to make the decision to go to war. It also takes, I believe, equally great leadership to decide what ceilings, what limits to put on what it is you're doing, particularly in the flush of victory. History would suggest that MacArthur and Truman failed that test of leadership. I would argue that President Bush 41 and his cabinet uh, met that test of history. It was a war fought out uh, for committed aims, the liberation of uh, Kuwait. It was done at extraordinarily limited costs. Uh, U.S. lives lost under 300, combat and non-combat. Financially, the war was a wash. It was paid for by the contributions of the uh, coalition uh, partners. And this is what strategy is all about. Strategy about, is about the balancing of, of interests and, and costs. And again, I believe this meets the test of strategy. And again, uh, none of this just happened. It's a point I'll come to in a minute. It is a real tribute to those who are making the uh, decisions, and I would suggest the decision-making process in this administration was about as good as it gets. The president deserves the ultimate credit. I would think Brent Scowcroft, the national security advisor, however, uh, is the, the, deserves the uh, also tremendous uh, credit. There's not a necessary link between the quality of the, the process and the quality of the policy, but history suggests there's a pretty good link. And I think in this case, it's, it's no surprise that the quality of the process was high and the quality of the result was high. Our third and last point, in addition to the fact that the war was right, right to wage and was waged right, and this may be, uh, come as somewhat more of a surprise, which is the consequences of this war, I would argue, were mostly positive, but quite limited. And by that I mean they were positive in addition to the liberation of, of Kuwait. Uh, six months or so after the war ended, you had the Madrid Peace Conference the first time Arabs and Israelis met face to face to negotiate peace. Flow of oil uh, maintained after a sh temporary short spike in prices. Prices uh, went down again. You had a U.S.-Russian cooperation. As I mentioned before, this principle that force ought not to be the, the arbiter of international relations. That was uh, done. But the, the follow-up was weak. And this is uh, in the sense that the Middle East peace process didn't move much beyond Madrid. The United States, now two decades after the war, still does not have an energy policy uh, that, it, that uh, it needs. Uh, there, was, there is no new world order that came out of this. This was not, in that sense, a transformational moment in international relations. Uh, it did not, end, certainly not for the greater Middle East, which remains the single most uh, troubled part of the world. Think Iraq, think Afghanistan, think uh, Iran, Lebanon. <laughs> What, what, what have you. But more broadly, this did not bring about, usher in a new age of international comity that people were uh, hoping uh, for. There's an ironic result, which is it may have made two very unfortunate things somewhat more likely. One is the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. I think one of the lessons that would-be tyrants learned from this war is the one place you don't want to fight the United States is on a conventional military battlefield. So instead, some have thought about raising up their arms, and I think the fact that the North Koreans and others and the Iranians are moving in this direction is no, is no surprise. They said, we need to make sure we have nuclear weapons so the United States uh, can't use conventional arms against us like it did against Iran. And it led others to think about terrorism, if you will, will to go below the conventional modern battlefield. One of the unintended or ironic consequences uh, of this. But I come back to my uh, basic point, that when you look at this on balance, uh, it averted uh, a far worse future, a far worse uh, scenario if the aggression had been allowed to stand. It would have led to all sorts of unfortunate events in the region. It would have led to all forts, uh, sorts of unfortunate events in the world. So what's the bottom line? Uh, let me give you two bottom lines, and then I'll stop. And if I've uh, not used all my time, I will yield the balance of my time to my right honorable colleagues here. Uh, first, uh, the Gulf War, and looked at in retrospect, and here we are 20 years later. It's not the Peloponnesian War. We're not looking at it centuries later, but it is, it is 20, uh, 20 years. Uh, I think uh, what's most important is what it helped avoid, rather than what achieved. And let me just be clear about that. It was a transformational event, not because it brought about a fundamentally different Middle East or fundamentally different world. It did. But had it not happened, had, it, had this aggression been, been allowed to stand, 
there would have been a fundamentally different Middle East and a fundamentally different world brought about, which would have been far, far, far war worse. So the great contribution of this war is for what it averted, more than for what it created. But that's not bad. That is not a criticism. Uh, a lot of history would have turned out a lot better if more things had been averted. Secondly, very little about this war, I think, was inevitable. And by that I mean a lot of people look at it with advantage of hindsight and say, ah, oh, it was obvious. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And of course the United States did what it, what it did. Of course this, the Bush administration decided to uh, use military force after diplomacy and sanctions didn't work. And of course it went so easily and so forth. Uh, it didn't look that way at the time. Uh, I actually think that one of the lessons of this is that people matter. There was nothing inevitable about what was decided and there was nothing inevitable about how it was implemented, either diplomatically or militarily. And if you follow a certain thought experiment, imagine if different people had been president at this time, or if different people had been around the president, a different president. Is it axiomatic or inevitable that you would have had an administration that from the get-go would have said, this will not stand, and would have then systematically built an international coalition, as Secretary Baker and others uh, did, tried the sanctions, tried the diplomacy, and then ultimately mount the sort of military effort we did, and then also put a ceiling on it, the way uh, that I believe was correctly uh, done. It is not obvious to me that that, uh, that that would have been done. And the lesson from this, again, is that there's, there's very little in history that uh, is inevitable or inexorable. And that the people who are in positions of power and the, the processes that those in power uh, follow when they make decisions count for a great deal. So my hunch is when this administration is a uh, judge, not just with 20 years of uh, perspective, but with uh, 40 years and longer, it will get extraordinarily high marks uh, as both uh, examples of how policy ought to be made about the integrity of the process, but also for the, uh, for the quality of the result. This is a uh, remarkable case of uh, focused decision making and the combination of many of the elements of national power from the diplomatic to the, to the military using the uh, range of tools from, from sanctions again to, to military force, both in the decisiveness of what to do, but also in the decisiveness of what not to do. Last point, American governments get into trouble at times for doing too little and too much. And what is so impressive about this uh, piece of history is this administration avoided both of those risks. It didn't do too little, it did not allow the aggression to stand, and it didn't too much, it resisted the temptation to use military force to try to remake uh, Iraq and the region. And I would simply suggest that subsequent history demonstrates the wisdom both of what was done and what was not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Haas. Incidentally, if you would like to see more of uh, form of analysis on this issue you would be wise to take a look at his most recent book, Wars of Necessity and Wars of Choice. Our second speaker is my colleague at the Bush School, Dr. Jeffrey Ingle, distinguished diplomatic historian whose latest project is working on a major history of the foreign policy of the 41st President of the United States. Dr. Ingle. Thank you, Chuck. Before I begin my formal remarks, let me just say what a pleasure it has been to see over the last several weeks and months the entire Texas A&M team come together for today's events. And the need to offer thanks to that hard work therefore abounds. But were I to begin down this path with any depth, I'd use up all of my allotted time. So I, but I would be remiss if I did not offer two specific words of thanks. First, to my fellow panelists for traveling so far to come here today and to offer their thoughts. And second, to the staff of the Bush School Dean's Office and that of the Skokoff Institute, but especially to Ambassador Larry Knapper, who is the real godfather of today's events. I was going to say something specific to Larry, but I think he's actually off doing diplomacy at the moment. So I will say it to Mrs. Knapper, you deserve a rest. So. 
Okay. <clears throat> Let me just move then to my formal remarks. It has been 20 years since the Gulf War. Saddam Hussein is dead. Kuwait remains liberated. American forces remain throughout the region. Yet consequences of the war still linger. Before August of 1990, the Persian Gulf was largely beyond Washington's direct sphere of influence. After, the United States, in effect, became a Gulf state. Washington's relationship with the region and with the world, and indeed relations between the Islamic and the Western worlds in the broadest sense, has not been the same since. I wish to make three points today, then, as part of this commemoration. First, that the Gulf War fundamentally altered America's relationship to the Middle East. Before 1990, Washington was an important but not yet a decisive regional player, concerned primarily with keeping the oil flowing with minimum involvement. Since 1991, conversely, it has become the region's most important player of all, all because of events that flowed from the central decision to counter Saddam Hussein's aggression with force. My second point elaborates upon the first, though it has far broader implications. It is simply that the Gulf War need not have been waged at all. Now let me be clear. When I say that the Washington need not have waged the Gulf War, I do not argue that Iraq could have been deterred or that Kuwait might have been liberated absent the use of force. Rather, I wish to remind this audience of a point that our first speaker brought up towards the end of his remarks, that each of Washington's primary decisions during this crisis, the decision to confront Hussein with force, the decision to defend Saudi Arabia, the decision to liberate Kuwait, and importantly, the decision to stop at that point, these were decisions indeed. It was hardly obvious in 1990 that the United States would respond as it did these were choices. American policymakers did not fight by reflex, and they fought instead in hope of a better world, which is, in fact, my third point, that the Gulf War served an important purpose for George Bush in particular in helping him define and forge the better world he envisioned as the real fruit of Cold War victory. The Gulf War, in this sense, represents nothing less than a pivot point in the, within the stream of history when fundamentally different paths were not only possible, but, and this is the key, they were equally plausible as well. For Bush, convinced that a fundamental restructuring of the international system was afoot with the Cold War's end, the Gulf War was nothing less than about the future. This was a malleable moment indeed. When considering the Gulf War, we need to recall that Washington could simply have let Hussein's aggression go. Many respected experts, including within Bush's own cabinet, ur urged just that, at least initially. Some argued that Washington cared most about the region's oil. And thus, so long as the great Middle Eastern gas station was open for business, the world could simply effectively hold its breath, excuse me, hold its nose, and accept Kuwait's demise. Other options existed as well for confronting Iraq. Washington could have accepted a so-called Arab solution, allowing the region's players to solve the crisis without international intervention. Such a move might have saved those governments historically wary of Western intervention, might have saved them a great deal of face, but it would invariably have resulted in an end to Kuwait's sovereignty. Perhaps the United States might have focused on economic sanctions alone, a popular approach in continental Europe in particular, or having chosen the military route, it could have halted the ground war before combat took its bloodiest toll, as Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev in particular lobbied. We should recall, in fact, that George Bush was not the only global leader with decisions to make during this pivotal moment in history. Gorbachev, for one, could have threatened to counter American force with his own. An unlikely scenario in 1990, but not an entirely implausible one, given long-standing Cold War tensions over the Gulf. Had Baghdad invaded Kuwait five years earlier, for example, when Moscow was still considered the evil empire throughout American policymaking circles, I put to you that we would have had a far different and far more dangerous crisis indeed. Yet none of these aforementioned eventualities came to pass. Not appeasement, not economic coercion, not a renewal of 
Cold War tensions or even an Arab solution for the fundamental reason that George Bush believed there was far more at stake in this crisis than simply little Kuwait. To fully appreciate this plastic moment in history, we must recognize that Washington's engagement with the Gulf looked far different in 1990 than it does today. Before 1990, American warships routinely patrolled Gulf waters, but the United States had little presence on the ground following the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and the pullout from Beirut several years later. There were, for example, no uh, US troops in Saudi Arabia, nor any defense arrangement with any Arab state with the exception of Bahrain. In fact, only the United Arab Emirates would even agree to joint military operations with the United States in the weeks preceding the Iraqi invasion as a deterrent force. All others thought this unthinkable. As Saddam Hussein himself candidly told the American ambassador in the weeks, excuse me, in the days before the attack, quote, he felt secure, secure in the belief that no Arab government would ever allow us to use their land for that purpose, attacking Iraq. Now, in retrospect, of course, this was one of Hussein's worst strategic decisions. But it was hardly an irrational one, for this was simply no 38th parallel in Korea or fold a gap in Germany, wherein American soldiers stood as tripwires of resolve. On the contrary, American strategists had for years, if not decades, hoped to influence the Gulf with as little direct involvement as possible, only enough, in fact, to ensure that the precious oil continued to flow. So long as the Soviets did not control the region, President Jimmy Carter had enunciated in 1980, so long as Iran did not disrupt shipping, President Reagan had said a few years later, American planners were by and large content. Ultimately, it did not matter to them who controlled the oil, so long as exports continued. And this, in fact, was the Bush administration's initial strategic line as well. Enunciated National Security Directive 26 nearly a year before the Iraqi invasion. It read, access to Persian Gulf oil was vital to US national security interests. But focus on that for a moment. What is vital here is access to the oil. In sum, before 1990, what Washington wanted most was one unhindered Gulf exports at minimum cost. Memories of hostages in Iran, destroyed barracks in Beirut, helicopters taking off from Saigon, and of nuclear showdowns with Moscow, left reason enough for strategists to be wary of any more active engagement. And American strategists, moreover, especially in those initial hours after the invasion, reasoned that Saddam Hussein was ultimately unlikely to withhold his oil from the world. After all, the entire reason for invading Kuwait in the first place was to sell its oil. This context matters for understanding the widespread American reluctance for a vigorous American response to Iraq's aggression. Secretary of State Baker, for one, privately cautioned George Bush that perhaps war just wasn't worth it. I know you're aware, he said, of the fact that this has all the ingredients that has brought down three of the last five presidents, a hostage crisis, body bags, and a full-fledged economic recession. We need recall as well that congressional opposition to the war came less from a sense of partisanship than from a true fear of the war's potential costs. As Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell, Ar Mitchell argued, the risks were great. He said, these included an unknown number of casualties and deaths, billions of dollars spent, a greatly disrupted oil supply and oil price increases, a war possibly widened to Turkey, Israel, and our other allies, the possible long-term occupation of Iraq by the United States, increased instability in the Persian Gulf, long-lasting Arab enmity towards the United States, and a possible return to isolationism here at home. Looking back, we can see, of course, that few of those things occurred in the immediate wake of the Gulf War, but that arguably all of Mitchell's fears, untold casualties, billions lost, disrupted markets, disaffected allies, Arab-American enmity, and a new wave of isolationism have all returned in time to haunt the United States. These and similar fears were present when the National Security Council first met on August 2nd of 1990 to discuss the Iraqi invasion. Their discussion proved anything but decisive. Moreover, National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft later termed the session appalling. My colleague on today's panel, Dr. Haas, who was a participant in that meeting, terms it in his own book 
a sharp disappointment. What Scowcroft found appalling and Haas disappointing was that many of Bush's advisors appeared content to accept Iraq's aggression. Secretary of Defense Cheney, for one, urged Bush to declare Saudi Arabia a vital national security interest, but by implication, Kuwait was not. Bush himself could not help but view the crisis in traditional Cold War terms, noting that we don't want to overlook the Soviet desire for warm water ports. Now, parenthetically, it's worth noting that every single one of the minutes of the National Security Council meetings have been throughout this entire crisis have been declassified with the exception of that first meeting. This still remains off limits to researchers, leading to my personal speculation that the arguments in favor of accepting the Iraqi conquest and of appeasing Saddam Hussein were in fact far worse and thus in retrospect far more embarrassing than we in the public are yet fully aware. But to return to August of 1990, it would not be, of course, for several more days that the world would learn of Bush's decision that this would not stand. In the interim, Scowcroft, Haas, and their State Department colleague, Lawrence Eagleberger, had won the president's endorsement of a vigorous response. Here, amidst this commemoration, a generation later, 20 years later, we should, I think, give ourselves the credit of being frank about what finally moved Bush to act. It was not the argument that Kuwait itself mattered much at all. Neither was it that Hussein's particular brand of evil required an American response, nor was Bush particularly persuaded that Iraq's aggression carried immediate strategic implications for the United States. Each of these reasons would in time come to influence Bush's decision, decisions and thinking in the weeks and months to come, but none were crucial during that first fateful week. Bush was instead persuaded, I believe, by the notion that he stood at a pivot moment in history. As Scowcroft explained in, that second, in the second national security meeting, after time to collect his thoughts and to marshal his arguments, he said, my personal judgments that the stakes in, the, in this for the United States are such that to accommodate Iraq should not be a policy option. There is too much at stake, he said. Scowcroft had earlier, in fact, made this point to Bush in a far more intimate setting. When the two flew in a small plane to an airfield that Air Force One, the usual Air Force One, could not accommodate. To hear Scowcroft tell the story, in fact, this intimate setting mattered for the way this history turned out. For the plane's passengers were packed so tight that their knees touched, their papers flopped from one lap to another. It was within this cramped space that the diminutive National Security Advisor leaned forward in his seat while pressing his argument against the President making his point while jabbing his hands with every point, trying to sway the much taller president. Eagleburger, within the second national security meeting, was equally dramatic. As he told the group, this is the first test of the post-Cold War system. As the bipolar con conflict is relaxed, it permits this, giving more flexibility because people are not worried about the involvement of the superpowers. If he, Saddam Hussein, succeeds, others may try the same thing and it would be a bad lesson. This argument ultimately persuaded Bush, who endorsed the fateful decision from which Washington's subsequent entanglement in the Gulf emanated. The key question, I think, is why? Why did Bush go against decades of state American policy, injecting force in the region unlike any other? It was because he saw within the Gulf crisis a bridge to a better world. His new world order, a term unveiled in response to the Iraqi crisis, a term ironically unveiled on September 11th of 1990, was not just a catchy phrase for Bush, but rather the culmination of a long and difficult journey of discovery. Along with the majority of his national security team, Bush was a relative latecomer to the notion that the Cold War was at an end and that Gorbachev could be trusted. Even after the Berlin Wall fell in 1989 and democracy erupted behind the Iron Curtain, Bush paused fearing in particular a violent crackdown, such as only witnessed recently at Tiananmen Square. Most profoundly, though, I think, Bush realized that the Cold War's end eliminated the most stable aspect of the international system since 1945, and Bush was, among all things, a man enamored by stability. Time and again during the early summer and spring of 1990, Bush told global leaders that their alliances verily required an enemy to survive. And in his words, the new enemy was instability itself. 
He told Helmut Kohl, for example, the enemy is unpredictability, apathy, and destabilization. He told Margaret Thatcher that when I am asked who our enemy is now, I tell them apathy, complacency. He even lost his temper during a press conference when asked by reporters to declare the Cold War over because he simply did not know the answer to the next obvious question, what would replace it? As Bush said, is the Cold War the same? I mean, is it raging like before in the times of the Berlin blockade? Absolutely not. Things have moved dramatically. But if I signal to you that the Cold War is over, then it's what are you doing with those troops in Europe? I mean, come on. That's a direct quote. Bush saw in the Gold War, in the cold, end of the Cold War, excuse me, Bush saw in the Gulf War, an opportunity as well as an invasion. In conclusion, he saw this as a chance to demonstrate that Washington would continue to lead, leading in particular to the kind of world promised his generation as their reward for vanquishing evil during World War II. It would be a world, he said, where the United Nations, freed from Cold War stalemate, is poised to fulfill the historic vision of its founders. Ultimately, this new world order of a, based on sovereignty and stability is what drove his thinking when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. As Bush publicly explained, the prospect of global peace depends on an American forward presence. Equally significant is what he said to Mikhail Gorbachev during the height of the Iraq war, when bombs and rockets rained down on Baghdad, when he said, let's not, remember, let's not forget that there are things, he said, far bigger in this conflagration than just Iraq or Kuwait, far bigger than this war, which will be over very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ingle, very much. Next, please welcome Michael Gordon, the highly respected senior military correspondent for the New York Times, who incidentally has a story in today's uh, edition. He is the author of two major books on the two Gulf Wars. He speaks today in his own capacity as authority on these subjects, not as a representative of the New York Times Corporation. Mr. Gordon. Well, thanks for making clear that I don't speak for the New York Times. Um, uh, I'm really here in my capacity as a co-author of a couple of two books on, on Iraq and one on this particular war. And, and even though I did cover uh, each of those uh, conflicts on the ground um, as a correspondent, and really we're all the product of our own experiences. And so a lot of what I have to say reflects those experiences on the ground in those two wars in, in Iraq. Um, and also, I, I want to thank uh, people who have really been very helpful to me. I came down here in, in November to do some research in the library here, which is really an excellent collection of, um, uh, we mentioned the Saddam archives, but the Bush archives. And uh, you know the staff there, um, Bob, I hope I don't murder his name, Holzweiss, and uh, my head of research assistant, Charles Colts, and Abby Dahl, who was very helpful to me. And they helped dig up a lot of the materials that I really rely on to flesh out my analysis. And I, I just, um, I've, I've, for all the study that I've done on the Gulf War and the three years I spent writing my The General's War, I, I continue to learn uh, new things about it, so, uh, uh, in, about American decision making and Iraqi decision making. Um, I have a slightly different perspective, uh, which I think is a balanced perspective. Uh, but uh, you know, the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003 has been so problematic and fraught with such difficulty, certainly prior to the surge, um, that uh, there's a tendency to look back somewhat wistfully at the first Gulf War as the good war, the war where everything was done right, um, and uh, and and. Uh, and certainly a lot was do done right. But I think it's important to have a, a sober view of what happened in that conflict and not really an idealized view of, uh, of, of how it unfolded. And, uh, you know, it, and it's certainly a proper that to ask certain questions about, about decision making in that war, um, not all of which I thought was quite as stellar as, as um, it's always been made out to be, and also the, the relationship to the second war. Um, first, on, on the upside, I absolutely agree with Richard that a lot was done right. And when you read through the documents, it's really impressive. Just I, I'd have to say it's masterful, the way the coalition was assembled, 
uh, it, it was a, such a diverse coalition. I mean, you're talking about the Syrians were in the force. The Egyptians had a division. Uh, and it was held together well. And uh, one thing that's very impressive to me is uh, President Bush did a lot of this one-on-one -on -one and all of these phone calls, these telecoms and memcoms, and, uh, and his knowledge and, and contacts throughout the world, knowledge of world leaders, um, he had, it was really interesting, even world leaders with whom he disagreed, like King Hussein of Jordan, which eventually sided with Iraq in this conflict, uh, he talked to him, and it was never my way or the highway, it was like, he, it was when Jordan basically supported Iraq, uh, President Bush spoke to him really more in, in sorrow than in anger. Uh, I think that part and the UN resolutions that were uh, secured was, was really done extremely well. Second of all, as Richards pointed out, and I, I agree, uh, President Bush and his team made the tough decision to go to war and reverse uh, the invasion. And I, I think we've all forgotten just how tough that was. But I recall since I was covering it for the Pentagon, there are any number of doomsayers who are predicting massive numbers of casualties. Some of them happen to be esteemed members. Congress or uh, at various think tanks in, in, in Washington with um, computer databases, and even indeed in his own administration, there were those, uh, General Powell and Secretary Baker, who understandably were so uh, more cautious and more wary of moving toward military action than I think President Bush and uh, General Scowcroft and, and Dick Cheney, then the Secretary of Defense, whom I covered. And so it was a tough decision, and he made it. He made it pretty early on, I think, in principle. And uh, he also provided the resources. He never hesitated. Uh, uh, no one was ever complaining about uh, they didn't have enough troops in the, in the Second War. There was a surfeit of resources, and I see absolutely uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I also think that I agree with Richard's analysis that uh, really what the Gulf War helped it's do is avoid uh, a much more difficult situation, a situation where Saddam uh, not only had the second world's largest oil resources, but Kuwait's oil's resources, WMD ambitions, and programs. And uh, it would have been a much more powerful, potent, and dangerous Ar Iraq. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's certainly the case. Um, but I do think there, there's sort of a number of areas that deserve uh, kind of further scrutiny and questioning if you're really going to dig into this war. Um, you know, first off, uh, you know, the, the Gulf War, Desert Storm, it's been described as a war of necessity. And, and, I, and I do agree with that, uh, it, that once Saddam invaded uh, Kuwait, it, was, it really was necessary to reverse that invasion, whether through economic sanctions or ultimately military force. But this was a war of necessity that didn't necessarily have to happen. And uh, I think uh, in the um, months leading up to uh, the war, the uh, Bush administration uh, had a policy of trying to moderate uh, Saddam Hussein's behavior, which I think was uh, certainly as a, as a policy uh, was reasonable. But there were a number of warning signs. And when I was flying down here, uh, I was on a plane with Skip Ganim, who became our um, ambassador in Kuwait after this. And he was recalling to me how in February 1990, he was at a meeting with April Glasby with Saddam. And Saddam was complaining about the presence of a military for the American fleet in the Gulf. Why did it need to be there? Uh, perhaps it was time it should leave. I think there are a number of signs that um, uh, his behavior was beginning to turn. You know, after 9-11, we say the failure, um, uh, sometimes they, people say it was intelligence failure, the intelligence community didn't connect the dots. Well, in this case, intelligence community did connect the dots. And uh, granted, it was in the month of July 1990, but um, I did a number of interviews, and uh, there was a particularly independent-minded uh, intelligence officer for warning at the CIA, Charlie Allen, and he was very struck in, toward the end of July that Saddam was requisitioning trucks from the private sector. It's not the sort of thing if you're trying to bluff a power you do because it has real consequences for your economy. And in July 25th, he issued a warning of war. Uh, they do it like the weather. So it's like 60% warning of war. I guess you can never be entirely wrong. Uh, but, um, and the DIA followed, Defense Intelligence Agency followed uh, shortly thereafter something similar. By August 1, it, it had been escalated a warning of attack. Um, now, you know, what happened was pretty interesting to me. The intel these intelligence experts, precisely because they were not Arab experts, were merely looking at military preparations on the ground, 
without the filter of knowledge of Arab affairs got it right. The people who got it wrong were the policy community who said, well, Arab countries don't attack, like uh, Assistant Secretary Kelly at the State Department, Arab countries don't attack other Arab countries, so it can't possibly happen. I mean, it can only be a bluff. They only want to take Booby on Island, because why would they do this? It doesn't make sense. Well, sometimes what you see is what you get. And um, there is an element of that there. And it's certainly the case that Kuwait was not asking for help. I interviewed the Kuwaiti ambassador at the time. I, I tried to get him to go on the record expressing his concerns. He was extremely concerned because he was getting debriefs about the tens of thousands of forces on his border. He wouldn't go on the record. Um, and we had no defense obligations with Kuwait. But I, I, I do think that um, if you're prepared to risk the lives of your soldiers and your treasure to contest a, a potential aggressive aggression, it's, it's a good idea to signal the aggressor that you're prepared to take this step before he takes it. And so what I think we did in Iraq is, you know, they say about you drawing a red line that the adversary shouldn't cross. Well, we drew a red line af behind the Iraqi forces after they crossed into Kuwait. Um, another area where I think uh, there should be additional scrutiny is really on the end game. And, you know, the goal of this war was not merely to evict the Iraqi forces from Kuwait. It was also to destroy their offensive power. It was an explicit goal. It was written in orders. The idea was to destroy the Republican Guard, not chase them away. Or, uh, and, and the reason was that uh, we're far away, and they are close, and if they merely leave, they can come back, which, by the way, they did a couple years later. And... Uh, and also, this was so it's really the offensive power of the regime, and also it's the force most loyal to Saddam Hussein. Um, and uh, the war didn't achieve that completely. And a, a decision was made, when the decision was made to stop the war at 100 hours, um, the battlefield was a swirling confusion. I mean, uh, not even General Schwarzkopf knew where all the divisions were, and, he, and it's evident in his own book. In fact, he expresses some irritation at subordinates who he claims led him. But I just think it's the fog of war. And this was a fast-moving event, uh, troops on the battlefield. Nobody really knew exactly what was going on. Um, and what I was out there or in, in the immediate aftermath and living with a lot of the forces. And what was striking to me was that um, the people closest to the action were the ones that were the most uh, uncomfortable with the decision and the war at 100 hours. The people further away who maybe had broader perspective but less knowledge of the battlefield situation were more confident. And what that really, uh, what the decision to end at 100 hours precluded was um, where there were two divisions uh, coming around, it was Barry McCaffrey's 24th Mechanized Division and Benny P's 101st Division, which were really trying to bottle up the remnants of the Republican Guard. And uh, Benny P wanted to put a brigade north of Basra, and they had them pushed in a pocket. And for a variety of reasons, they, well, the Republican Guard was in fighting, was fleeing, but they really needed another day or two to fulfill this plan. Uh, nobody consulted with them, and now you can't blame President Bush for that, certainly, but um, uh, I, I do think that uh, in a, a confused situation like that, you, you just can't make a clear judgment, well, we've accomplished everything we can. It was done by intuition, certainly not on the basis of clear intelligence. And as it emerged, Later, uh, I think, because uh, I wrote a story about it, I looked it up, and, they, and it was based on intelligence assessments. It was, I think, uh, about a fourth of the Iraqi armor got out, and a significant number of those were Republican Guard tanks, and a lot of their headquarters units got out. The Hammurabi unit got out more or less intact. That's the one that came back a few years later, and then we had to send some forces back to Kuwait. Um, judging, I'm just saying, judging the campaign by its own standards, it fell short. It was a success, but it wasn't as successful as it could have been. Um, a couple last things uh, on the end game. Uh, there's an episode uh, which I struck impressed me because it was out in southern Iraq then, where uh, the Shia rose up, and it was right in the aftermath of the war. They rebelled, and uh, General Schwarzkopf had allowed the um, Iraqi army uh, to f uh, military to fly helicopters. They said, oh, the bridges are down. We need to get around. And then, of course, they abused this. And they, they used these helicopters to go after the Shia and launch armed helicopter attacks against them, a clear violation of what was intended. Uh, and the question arose what to, what to do about this. Uh, ultimately, a decision was made to let it stand. I think because of fears of getting embroiled in Iraq's internal affairs, getting caught up in a civil war, 
not being want to see in undermining Schwarzkopf. At the same time, we imposed a no-fly zone in northern Iraq to protect the Kurds. Kind of a double standard there. Um, and okay, you can you can say those reasons are maybe justified, but but you know then in August of 1992, 18 months later, the Bush administration opposes a um, no-fly zone in southern Iraq to squeeze Saddam. So a question I would ask is if it was the right thing to do not to shoot down helicopters and impose a no-fly zone in southern Iraq to protect the Shia, we're not arming them. If that's the right thing in uh, March of uh, 1991, why did we do the opposite in August of 92? And if it was the right thing to do in the August of 92, maybe it would have been better if it had been done earlier. Um, a couple of uh, points just to wind up and stay on within my time uh, limits. I do think um, that the war had a, was, uh, did influence in a very important way the second war, which is it's hard to think that there would have been a second war if there hadn't been the first war. I'm not saying the second war was absolutely necessary to co finish the com uncompleted business of the, of the first war. What I'm saying is the fact that there were UN resolutions on, on disarmament that Saddam violated presented the choice to a subsequent Bush administration about what to do, a difficult choice, whether to continue with sanctions or use force. It's a dilemma that I think was framed in the context of the first war. Second of all, a lot of the military strategy on the Iraqi side and the American side was really influenced by the first war. Saddam was first and foremost concerned about a Shia uprising in the second war, he distributed Saddam Fedayeen and Ba'ath Party militia around the south so he could suppress them, gave his military orders not to destroy bridges so he could rush forces down there if he needed to. It turned out to be very convenient for the 3rd Infantry Division getting to Baghdad. But the, um, it was, that was his main worry. His main worry was not the Americans going to Baghdad because they didn't do it the first time, so they figured they wouldn't do it the second time. And similarly, the, I think the Americans uh, were very much influenced by the first war in that the goal of the military, and I was embedded with them, was to destroy the Republican Guard. And they thought, once they do that, we've won because that was the um, the primary adversary in the first war. I think that the war had a profound effect on the Shia, who didn't rise up in the second war, because they kind of remembered what happened to them in the first war. And I think today have a complicated relationship with the United States. They, you know, certainly we made it po possible for a Shia majority in Iraq to be the new government in Iraq. Um, and I think that uh, they should appreciate that. But there, there was a moment there, and. 91 when we certainly didn't didn't back them and lastly I, I think it had a um, Interestingly on the political debate it had a, a profound effect because I think the Congress fought the last war just like Saddam fought the last war in 2003 and the Americans fought the last war and the Shia fought the last war the Congress fought the last war in that when they had the debate the first time around much, much of the Democratic Party opposed uh, the Gulf the Gulf War to liberate Kuwait primarily because they thought it would be harder than it was um, it turned out to be easier than they thought. So the second time around, uh, they supported the campaign. Uh, Congress didn't really ask nearly enough questions about what the nation building and, and so-called post-conflict settlement was going to be like and what was going to happen after the toppling of Saddam uh, because they saw political advantage in supporting the war. And they, there seemed to be some sort of unconscious assumption that the second war would be as easy as the first. So I, I do think, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, be um, uh, unduly negative, and I think on balance you have to, uh, I agree with Richard, you have to account, uh, view the Gulf War as, as an overall achievement uh, for the Bush administration and, uh, and give credit uh, where uh, credit is due. But I do think um, there are a number of questions can be asked, and they may be unanswerable, including whether if we had fulfilled our military objectives in full in the Gulf War, if we hadn't announced that we weren't going to Baghdad, therefore taking the psychological pressure off the regime, if we hadn't told them we were getting out right away, uh, basically we removed our, when we had maximum leverage over Iraq, we, we sort of unilaterally uh, diluted it. And, you know, uh, historians can debate whether all of this accrued influence at that point in time and, and pressure might have destabilized the Saddam Hussein regime and made the second war unnecessary. I'm not prepared to get that far, but I do think it's an open question. And uh, that's my perspective on, on uh, a war which I basically think in the main was, was done very well, certainly by the military, and, and I think uh, 
you know, handled uh, ably uh, by the civilians. Our next speaker to this forthcoming volume is Dr. Shibley Telhami, who is the Anwar Sadat Professor and at the University of Maryland. Through his extensive writing, his periodic consultation with the United States government, and his work at the Brookings Institution, Dr. Telhami is widely recognized as one of the leading Middle East experts in the United States. Dr. Telhami. Thank you very much. <clears throat> It's an honor for me to be here uh, for this important occasion. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of flavor of the regional context of the war. I know we've talked about uh, the decision making in Washington. We've talked about the end of the Cold War, the global context. And I'd like to give a sense of the regional, of the regional context and how, how it has changed since. Um, let me begin with a little personal note. Um, that informs, in some ways, my thinking on this issue. Uh, just before uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait uh, in the spring of 1990, I was uh, on the staff of Congressman Lee Hamilton, who was then uh, the chair of the subcommittee on Europe and the Middle East of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Representatives. I was there as a Council on Foreign Relations fellow, uh, Richard Haas, uh, at that time, uh, uh, as an academic in government. Uh, and uh, Lee uh, uh, and I talked about the implications of the end of the Cold War for the Middle East. So I went out to the region, uh, in, in, uh, based on that, uh, to study sort of how Arabs see the implications of the Cold War uh, uh, for the Middle East. And I went uh, to many countries in the region, including Iraq. In fact, uh, I was a guest of April Glaspies, and we went to see um, uh, American officials there and uh, Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, who was still in Baghdad at that time. That was the beginning of July, uh, the beginning of June, sorry, of, of 1990. Uh, a few weeks later, um, I had already planned to change to move from Congress to be with Tom Pickering at the U.S. delegation at the United Nations, an advisor on the Middle East, which had been planned prior to the invasion uh, of Kuwait, uh, based on my uh, academic interpretation of the end of the Cold War being important. And I thought that the General Assembly in the fall of 1990 would be extremely interesting to look at how uh, the power configurations are shaping up, uh, with the U.S. being the preeminent power in the world. So uh, I was already slated to move to, uh, to the U.N., and in fact did move to the U.N. Uh, immediately after Iraq invaded Kuwait, and I was there for the duration of, of the crisis. So I have a, a, a sense that informs my assessment of this, which I have written about in the past, but I'd like to focus on certain aspects, of uh, particularly of the Iraqi decision, uh, to invade Kuwait, and then uh, the formation of the Arab coalition in support of Desert Storm, what happened, and then finally the consequences of what transpired. Um, let me give you a, a backgrounder in terms of the broader sentiment, which I wrote up. I'm not just making it up in my own mind. I wrote it up in a report right after my uh, trip uh, uh, dated uh, June uh, 1990. Um, the vast majority of Arab elites in every, every state I visited had a negative interpretation of the Cold War. Uh, they saw uh, the uh, end of the Cold War uh, as empowering the U.S. and reducing the strategic pressure on the U.S. Uh, to take, uh, quote, even-handed positions in the Middle East. And they all believed that American foreign policy is going to be far more pro-Israel uh, than, than not. That was widely shared view uh, it, at a time when there was intense confrontation on the Israeli-Palestinian front, because this is a period when the Intifada was still very strong. The Palestinian uprising started really the end of 1987, and, and it was the, the late 80s. It was if, flaring up all over the place. And, uh, and there was a sense in, in the Arab world of asking how will the Arab world deal with this strategic reality under the Cold War and compensate for 
you know, the absence of the Soviet Union as a counterweight to the United States uh, in the Middle East. In this environment, uh, clearly the Palestinian issue was a central issue in the debate. Uh, and when I look back at that whole period, it is clear to me that uh, when Saddam Hussein made his plan to invade Kuwait, he was looking at a strategic uh, picture in the region that was looking to fill a vacuum of power in the Arab world. Uh, Arabs were divided. Egypt, which had historically been a very important player, was only then emerging from its isolation after it signed its peace treaty with Israel. Uh, and uh, clearly, um, uh, the, the public sentiment and the elite sentiment was very frustrated, defiant, uh, and, and uh, uncertain about what, what might come next. Now, Saddam Hussein was in a very good uh, uh, position to exploit the environment. Uh, Iraq was seen to have emerged as being victorious in the war with Iran. Uh, more than it really was in, in fact, because actually when you look at the military outcome, yes, Iran in essence agreed to end the war, but there was a perception that Iraq emerged powerful at the end of, uh, at the end of that war, and Iraq was making much of its military superiority or, or apparent military superiority, including some threats toward Israel, particularly in the spring of 1990. In my own judgment, uh, Saddam Hussein pursued a three-track policy mostly oriented toward uh, neutralizing the influence of Saudi Arabia. And when you look at what has happened, uh, it is a strategy that's clearly planned out the week, the, in, the, in the year before. Uh, on the one hand, he entered into a, uh, an agreement with Egypt, Yemen, and Jordan, all surrounding Saudi Arabia in the so-called Arab Cooperation Council, which was seen as a counterweight to the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, in which he asserted uh, his role, uh, uh, trying to assert himself as a leader. Uh, and in February of 1990, uh, gave a speech to the Arab Cooperation Council, in which he gave the same interpretation of the end of the Cold War that I just outlined that was pervasive in the Arab world, uh, in which, for the first time he, since the end of uh, the war with Iran, he characterizes, in essence, the U.S. as a threat. That was a worrisome speech that was noticed in Washington uh, and uh, outlined a possible response. And in it, actually, he anticipates not that the U.S. will be less inclined to engage in wars. He actually said, quote, the U.S. Is, will be more inclined to engage in, quote, stupidities. Uh, because of the absence of the Soviet counterweight, so that Arabs should be anticipating more American interventionism, not less American interventionism, which is interesting in retrospect given his invasion of Kuwait. Um, the second thing that he did was enter into a, an agreement with Saudi Arabia, uh, which is a non-belligerence agreement, uh, to assure that uh, the Saudis would not allow forces to attack from their soil against Iraq. And the third thing he did was to champion the Palestinian cause in public opinion, uh, not only by his statements, uh, but by uh, uh, increasing the relationship with Yasser Arafat, at the head of the PLO, and then holding a conference, the Arab Summit Conference in Baghdad, the end of May, uh, which focused specifically on the issue of Jerusalem and the issue of, of Palestine, which he ins insisted be a public uh, summit. Uh, sure, it had its uh, private side, but in the public ones, he would assert uh, the, the support for the, the Palestinian issue and, and pledged uh, financial support and insisted on his colleagues publicly pledging financial support, including the Saudis, all of whom uh, pledged support for that issue. He understood the issue of Palestine mobilized in public opinion, so he thought he had public opinion on his side. And so my own view of his calculations as he invaded uh, Kuwait uh, was that he believed that all these arrangements that he had put in place, uh, sort of uh, isolating Saudi Arabia up to a point, uh, uh, winning Arab public opinion, he thought. Uh, in fact, there was an assumption that the Saudis are not stable enough to withstand uh, Arab public opinion. 
Uh, and all of that, I think, led to a, a conclusion that the Saudis would not dare allow American troops on their soil to wage war against another Arab country. And in my own view, that is the biggest mistake Saddam Hussein made. Uh, it was not about the U.S. not being willing to take some risk in a changed international environment. There's much record to show that he believed the U.S. is capable of uh, 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 waging uh, military attacks in the Middle East. Uh, but he believed that the Saudis uh, would not allow American forces on their soil. Uh, and if the U.S. Uh, did not have ground forces operating from Saudi Arabia, he can, at a minimum, can buy a lot more time uh, for public opinion to be on his side. Now, he obviously failed. And um, it is a very important question for us to say why he's failed. Does, is Arab public opinion irrelevant? Did he miscalculate? What happened in, uh, in the Arab world since? Do we what, what, what do we learn from that, uh, and what were the consequences after? First, he failed uh, in think uh, about the calculations of governments. And, and it's a little bit puzzling, because it is extraordinary to think that a, a, a king of Saudi Arabia, who cannot be absolutely sure that Iraq will not attack him, uh, uh, who sees Iraq being empowered uh, by uh, the occupation of Kuwait, uh, will just worry more about his public opinion than worry about Iraq. Uh, uh, in an environment where uh, the U.S., the only superpower in the world, is asking uh, uh, Saudi Arabia to uh, take its side. Uh, that clearly was, I think, automatic for the Saudis, and, and certainly the Egyptians uh, also supported the coalition. But the, the interesting thing is that our public opinion did not prevent uh, the coalition from emerging. And, uh, and, and I think in some ways there has been an assumption over the past decade based on that kind of consideration, assumption in part by the international community, in part by uh, the governments in the region, uh, that Arab public opinion matters up to a point on the margins, but it really doesn't affect the big questions on the table. And for that reason, it's very important to think about what that, why that happened, why the Arab public opinion didn't matter much, and what happened in between, and where is it today? And I'll say that very briefly. Um, uh, first, uh, I think Arab public opinion, like any public opinion, it ranks issues. And it's clear that those communities that were closer to the Arab-Israeli issue, such as Jordanians and Palestinians, uh, were very much opposed to the war. And actually, it forced the King of Jordan, in some ways, uh, to go against his traditional support for the US uh, to uh, 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 go with Saddam Hussein uh, in, that, uh, in that particular case. So it did have an impact the closer you were to the Arab-Israeli issue. In the Gulf region, obviously, uh, the public was somewhat divided. On the one hand, they didn't like the United States and its role. On the other hand, they were threatened directly by what Saddam Hussein did. So uh, there was, a, at, at a minimum, a division within uh, the, the, the Gulf region of Arab public opinion. Second, uh, there was a, an information uh, machinery that was mostly unified. Uh, in contrast to today, where you have the Arab satellites where there's no government that monopolized information. Uh, in 1990, actually, there was far more limited transnational information. There was some, but it was l primarily government-controlled media. Uh, and the information was extremely important in that particular war. And actually, the US saw it as particularly important. And the fact that the US managed to get almost everyone on the side of that coalition, including in uh, Syria, the exception of Jordan, including Syria, which had been on the other side of the U.S. on many issues, uh, created a, in some ways, a hegemonic uh, interpretation, uh, with Jordan being all, the only kind of uh, pocket of information that provided uh, Saddam Hussein's story. Uh, and I think today uh, this 
cannot be the case. Uh, we've seen what happened in 2003 in the war, uh, where in fact uh, the information uh, uh, could not be controlled by any single government, and there was a clear uh, frustration in this uh, in the United States uh, based on uh, the uh, the role that Al Jazeera particularly was playing uh, in giving a story uh, to those that the U.S. opposed and, and certainly to the to the Iraqis. Uh, and still, even then, I would say uh, that the public reaction was limited. Uh, I want to end just with, with two conclusions. Uh, one is that, uh, yes, I think even today, when push comes to shove, Arab governments will go against the will of the people uh, to do what's best for them, uh, to stay in power. But two things they cannot be sure about. One is, the unfolding information revolution, and they're all worried about what happened now in Tunis. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, there is increasing fear. And the second thing I want to say is that the net result of the governments going against the public and the gap increasing between publics and governments is that repression intensifies. Repression intensifies. And in my own judgment, this process had led to the intensification of repression uh, in the past decade. And I don't think we should underestimate the role that both the 1991 war and the 2000 war played in essentially bolstering the institutions of repression because governments have had to do things that are highly unpopular with the public and they can only do it by intensifying repression. And we have to be very mindful of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tahami. We are very fortunate to have with us, uh, as a special guest, someone who will react to the presentations that you have all heard. Uh, he is Dr. Abdul Rila Siyas. Um, Abdul Rila Asiri. Asiri. Who is the Dean of the College of Social Sciences at uh, the University of Kuwait. He has uh, uh, published widely on uh, the uh, work of international relations and has served as an advisor to his government. Welcome. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to be with such nice, intelligent audience. <laughs> and frankly, I'm um, half jet lagged. <laughs> so don't take my words seriously. <laughs> I have prepared two options. Option one, if the audience are students, just like my colleagues, for the last 30 years plus I've been teaching. So it's easy to deal with the student and uh, their question, their answer. Option two, I prepared a paper. And if the audience is of such a nature, so I should stick to my statement. So I will read a little, but Mr. Chair, there is one thing I've learned now, and I will apply it in my college. When, whenever we have public lecture, I'll put some lady, nice pretty lady like this, <laughs> with a warning with her to give the time, because usually when you deal with Academician, it's very hard to get into the time. So my dear lady, don't raise your flag of warning, but let me continue and I'm sure I will finish within the time frame. <laughs> January 17, 1991 was a moment of hope and joy for all Kuwaitis and I'm sure for the Americans. Given the political will and personal conviction of the American administration to rectify unjust war against a peaceful, a small nation state of Kuwait, with plentiful of goodwill with outside war. Whereas August 2nd, 1990 was a day of shock, despair, 
and tragedy. The Iraqi invasion of my homeland, Kuwait, on August 2nd, 1990, and I was in, in Kuwait, and I saw the brutality of that invasion, was unprecedented in international politics and neighborly relationship. In fact, Kuwait, as I'm sure some of you know, has a tradition of political vitality, unique cultural diversity, and economic prosperity. These are pillars of the state. Kuwait played a role of active, sometimes activist, leading role in Arab, regional, and international politics. Kuwait played a dual role of donor mediator. The state's wealth, non-ideological position, pragmatist posture, a free press made it a desirable bride for both camps in the climax of the Cold War eras of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Kuwait was the only Gulf countries of the six GCC states which has a diplomatic relation with the old Soviet Union and the other Eastern camp. And the Soviet flag was raised in Kuwait from the early 60s until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Kuwait experiment with an open democratization process made it a model to emulate in a region of closed societies and regime. Indeed, a success story for a small state. Therefore, it was a shock for all states, small or large, powerful or powerless, east or west, when Iraq invaded, occupied, and annexed Kuwait on groundless claims. The irony was the failure of Arab regional politics, which could not protect, neither shield Kuwait from Arab threats. Since the stereotype threat was that non-Arabs are the source of threats, assuming that an Arab state protects, not attacks its sister, state. However, that belief system was proven false at a moment of trial and urgency. In fact, the invasion exposed the fragility of Arab politics, whereas the world was unified against Iraq. The Iraqi invasion came at a critical juncture in an emerging new world order the soft politics of some six months of diplomacy failed to achieve the goal of forcing Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait peacefully. Despite the fact that Kuwaiti felt, felt that they were pioneer in a number of areas in that part of the world, and they have the best of life, but the trauma of losing one's homeland could not be redeemed. Hard politics was the answer to the military imbalance between Kuwait, Gulf states, and Iraq. Imagine for a moment what would have been the texture and picture of Kuwait, the Gulf, regional and international politics if the Iraqi invasion was tolerated or even settled diplomatically. The political will and determination of President George Bush to stop a tyrant, President Saddam Hussein, from swallowing Kuwait and threatening regional status quo and security is highly, is highly appreciated and actually valued in setting up a precedent in international politics. In fact, In fact, Daddy Bush <laughs> have entered the conscience of Kuwaiti people and the annals of history as a liberator or better, a symbol for freeing nation state from ty tyranny and dictatorship. When he visited Kuwait after liberation and after leaving presidency, Kuwait was in celebrity a big wedding, a big reunion 
for a man who deserved that. The liberation of Kuwait was a stage one of a larger campaign to liberate the area. And that was, was ended in a campaign to liberate Iraq at a later stage. I would like to give a note on liberating Iraq. I just came back from Iraq last week after a five-day visit from northern Iraq, Erbil, to Najaf. <laughs> Five minutes warning. <laughs> I said, change my gear, shift my gear. <laughs> from Erbil, Baghdad, Najaf, and Karbala. And believe it or not, despite the fact that we hear about terrorism, about our American occupation of Iraq, Iraqi people, and I talked with them in the street and officials, they realized if it wasn't for America, the Middle East would have been totally different. So thank you, America. Five minutes, now it's four. In conclusion, Look, after all these smiles, you should give me extra, but I'll get leave you some time. <laughs> In conclusion, Desert Storm was a turning point which culminated not only in liberating a besieged small nation state and reinforcing a basic principle in international law to protect the independence and integrity of a sovereign nation. Thanks to the rational, and legal behavior of President Bush administration, United Nations reasserted its role as a leading agent in new areas which was exclusive to it. Human rights and democratization processes worldwide. Indeed, a strategic alliance was built between Kuwait, the Gulf State, and United States. The new relationship was reached by public demands and insistent, not by government to government request, not a secret deal, but an open politics. Ever since, the United States retook its role and symbol for, re for liberating a free world. And look at the former Republic of the Soviet Union or East Europe. President Bush became a reborn messiah for Kuwaitis. The successful campaign of Desert Storm made it possible for us in Kuwait to celebrate three momental national occasion next month. 50 years of independence, 20 years of liberation, and five years of accession to the throne for the new emir. Americans, you are great people and power. And Kuwaitis are grateful for your role, which lived up to your spirit and soul. Above all, <clears throat> above all, in political terminology, a reassertion of a basic lesson we all learn in higher education in the state. That is in the courses of government and politics of America, American foreign policy, it's a preservation and promotion of national interest. Desert Storm was a reinforcement of a mutually inclusive case of our national interest. Indeed, a successful case to be celebrated, lectured, researched, documented, talked for years to come. A turning point in human history. Thank you very much. America, thank you very much, President Bush. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.
thank you, Dr. Osiri. That was much appreciated after a tremendous jet lag that you. <laughs> <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we raised a number of questions and I jotted down. I hope we could have some dialogue on these during, among our panelists. But unfortunately, we have exhausted our time. And it's important to keep you on schedule. You are our guests. Uh, Bush School students are going to us provide assistance to help everyone get on buses to go over to Reed Arena. So if when you exit the auditorium, if you will make a turn to the left and go out that exit, there will be people there to guide you and help you board buses. But before you leave, would you join me in giving a round, long, warm applause to our excellent panelists? Thank you.